NBC TV 18. This week on Storyboard, we are in conversation with Atit Mehta, Head of Marketing at Think and Learn Private Limited by Use the Learning App, who is joining us from Doha and speaking about their World Cup association, roping in Lionel Messi and being a part of the most scrutinized World Cup in history. We have Vivek Gambhir, CEO of Board, sharing what lies ahead for the brand, winning growth strategies and marketing plans. And on the sidelines of WPP Commerce, we caught up with CBL Srinivas, country manager WPP India, spoke to him about the future of commerce and much more. And finally, we get you the sneak peek into CNBC TV 18's Marquee Nights with Yannick Bolore, Chairman Vivendi and Chairman and CEO Avas Group. Hello and welcome to Storyboard, I'm Shabani Gharat. The FIFA World Cup 2022 kicked off last weekend and many of us football fans have exciting weeks of football lined up for us ahead. While Indian team might not be playing at the World Cup, but we have an Indian brand as one of the global sponsors for the FIFA World Cup happening in Qatar for the first time, which is Baiju's. I'm catching up with Atit Mehta, Head of Marketing at Think and Learn Private Limited, Baiju's the learning app, who's joining us straight from Qatar about their World Cup association, roping in Lionel Messi, one of the world's highest paid footballers and then facing a backlash for signing him soon after laying off 2,500 employees. Atit, welcome to CNBC TV 18. Thank you very much for having me. Atit, first up, how is it in Doha? What does it feel like watching the World Cup live? No, it's it's quite an uh, carnivalish type of a feeling. The entire city has been lit up. One should drive around uh, post 5.36, post sunset, and you will feel like every part of the city is lit up. Every part of the city has that excitement of the uh, FIFA World Cup. Overall, mm. good. Uh, only, only thing is that the stadiums are a bit far off. So one needs to plan properly in terms of time taken to reach the stadium. But once you go over there, all the effort one has taken to reach there is uh, minimized. And it's, it's, it's a feeling which money can't buy. To see the logo, the brand logo on the ground, how does it feel as the brand custodian uh, of Baiju's? I remember first match when the first match which I attended, my hmm. I was not watching the match. I was only looking out that where in the brand is coming, recording every piece of it, recording from an every angle. So mm. obviously, as, as marketeers and as business people, you will always look out for your brand and over here the brand is there. Mm. So right, it's, it's, the feeling is good. A uh, lot of people have reached out, a lot of people have uh, spoken to us in terms of that we saw you on television. So yeah, the effort which has gone in over the last six, seven months is finally coming to light. And then, uh, Atit, earlier, you also roped in Messi, Baiju's first World Cup and Messi's last. Tell us about your strategy and thought behind roping in Messi. How did that happen and what will he bring to the table? The primary reason for us to sign up with FIFA was uh, markets outside India. Hmm. We have a reasonable uh, operations and businesses going in LATAM, especially Mexico, hmm. Argentina, and some of the other countries in LATAM, where football is the biggest thing. He, he, Messi is the biggest uh, I can uh, ever seen by uh, LATAM outside Maradona and Pele uh, in our current times. So the, the, the reason of signing Messi was primarily to put the brand at the forefront, hmm. especially in LATAM. Hmm. Yeah. We signed him in the uh, start of the financial year in March, April. While we announced it uh, right now, just before the World Cup, as we finished our communication and shoot and everything else. Mm -hmm. So the larger reason of having uh, somebody like uh, Messi on board is for our international markets. And mm -hmm. uh, the advertising campaign which we created is already getting played out in those markets. Mm -hmm. We are seeing initial traction where people are at least discovering the brand. People are relating to the brand. You have Messi as a brand ambassador. You have on-ground branding happening during the FIFA World Cup. Mm -hmm. So if you just add up all these things, you are mm -hmm. now creating a, a sort of a presence in the consumer's mind. And that was the objective. So far, so good. And it, it's, it's growing every day. Okay, so Baiju's also faced backlash for signing in Messi, one of the world's highest paid footballers as a brand ambassador, soon after laying off 2,500 of your employees. 
what do you have to say on that and do you feel this whole announcement was ill timed it was just a coincidence that uh, we we went into some amount of right sizing hmm and the messy announcement came but it was not something one had planned for these are hmm. two independent pieces uh, while messy as i said was primarily signed for international markets the spill over in india is humongous and that's hmm. good for all of us uh, hmm. while the, while the right sizing exercise uh, was primarily hmm. for india okay do you see the impact of this backlash on the objective that you set out to achieve by roping in messy in the first place no so there there was enough and more chatter uh, mm. on social media platform mm. but yeah so see people uh, who understand the the strategic reasons why we do what we do all of us uh, what we do uh, understands the larger piece there mm. are some section of the of of the social media who started talking about that uh, these guys have gone and signed messi and on on the same side they are uh, right sizing x amount of people but at an overall level uh no major impact it's unfortunate that we had to go through this exercise uh, because of uh, all the reasons we know of mm. but uh, these are independent uh, initiatives uh, brand initiative is for international markets and we mm. we are true to that objective and uh, the overall strategy the overall planning and overall approach with mm. fifa as well as messi at least in latam is working wonderfully well for us Now the Qatar 2022 is arguably the most scrutinized world cup in the history uh, so from an official sponsor standpoint what is your opinion on this no so scrutiny is one part so see everybody needs to follow the law of the land mm. and uh, the world cup is happening in this part of the world and mm. one needs to follow the rule uh, which is laid out by the government but as far the restrictions are concerned yes it's a quite a restrictive process Uh, mm. from a sponsor perspective or even from a fan perspective but if you follow the instruction if you do things on time it's it's a very very well planned system you mm. will not face any issues any problems but if, if one ends up doing uh, any sponsor based activity 4 days before the start of the world cup it will not be possible and then you must have also met uh, other sponsors uh, you know what do they feel specially about the restrictions and stuff and what happened with budweiser what are they saying yeah so i haven't uh, met the budweiser guys uh, but yeah uh, all the other sponsors whether it's visa whether it is uh, coke whether it is hyundai kia all of them are pretty happy now the advantage uh, which ev every brand has its own advantage now for mm -hmm. example uh, hyundai has the opportunity of showcasing its uh, future cars so mm -hmm. they might be doing that yeah coke has set up a nice uh, setup at least in some of the stadiums where one can go and you know experience the coke zone uh, so on mm. and so forth so every brand has the opportunity to do it and uh, i've i've spoken to two or three co sponsors and all of them are equally happy equally uh, tense that uh, hope there are no changes coming in from the business because any change to be implemented right now will take lot of time and then finally the most important question which team are you rooting for you know so we are all rooting for uh, argentina so there are good chances that if the team does not top the group they will be second and they will get into the round of 16 so fingers crossed adi thank you so much thanks for joining us on the show today and sharing your insights with us thanks shubhani thank you very much it is time for a short break on the other side we have vivek gambhir ceo of boat and we are also catching up with cbl shrinivas country manager wpp india and speaking to him about the future of commerce A long journey has taken us where we've never been before. The new Rado Captain Cook Plasma High Tech Ceramic Rithic Roshan Special Edition. Feel the difference, Rado. इस सुपर फास्ट जमाने में कार इंश्योरेंस क्लेम का स्ट्रेस क्यों? एक्वा ऐप पे क्लेम सेटलमेंट सुपर फास्ट होता है. Get super fast claim settlement. Echo, welcome change.
Welcome back. Boat is one of most exciting startups that has emerged in the recent years. But how did Boat go from being a challenger brand to one of the leading consumer tech companies in India? We find out more about the brand's journey from Vivek Gambhir, CEO of Boat. In an interview with Delsha Dirani, he also shares what lies ahead for the brand, winning growth strategies and marketing plans. It's been an absolutely exciting time for startups and new emerging brands in India. Lots of highs, lots of lows. So let me begin by asking you a little bit about, you know, what's your report card for this past year been like? For us, I think it's been an incredible journey thus far. And over the last uh, few months or so, uh, we've continued to really strengthen our business and maintain our strong growth momentum. Uh, we have crossed over 3,000 crores in uh, revenue. We are now the number two brand globally in the earwear category and the number five brand uh, globally uh, in the wearables category. And so uh, the other brands are the likes of Apple, Samsung, and a couple of the Chinese players. So it's a matter of great pride that a brand that was born in India in such a short amount of time has earned so much brand love to be now amongst the biggest brands uh, in the world. Uh, do you still consider Boat a challenger brand then? Has it, has it shed its challenger brand mindset? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, you know, we recognize, look, when Boat started, there were a couple of hundred brands that had started in India at the same time. And uh, we were competing against players who were much, much larger than us. Uh, and even today, some of our competitors are very large global companies uh, that are significantly you know, bigger than us. And so while it is a matter of pride that an Indian brand has managed to achieve leadership position where our market share today in personal audio is almost four times more than the number two player. In spite of that, I think um, I believe that the future is even more exciting. So being paranoid, being humble, being agile, and being obsessed with consumers that's what really keeps on getting us going. Uh, you joined Boat in 2021, early 2021, and you came from um, well-established legacy companies like Bain and then Godrej, where you were CEO. So uh, tell me, what were some of the goals that you set, some personal goals that you set for yourself at Boat? And fa how far along are you in, uh, in terms of achieving them? My mandate with um, Aman and Samir, uh, it was about adding muscle to the hustle, you know, as we called it. There are some incredible qualities that has made both successful so far, but we also know that what got us here will not get us in the future. So being able to preserve the legacy, preserve the values and shape the culture, uh, enter new categories, uh, think of bigger dreams, scaling up the company. I think essentially that's been my mission. But the idea is to work very closely with both the co-founders who are still very involved in the business. And I think what we you know, keep on saying is, is there a way for one plus one plus one to really make this a much, much more bigger uh, you know, entity? We call ourselves the three idiots, uh, you know, and so, uh, but the idea is to work together with them very closely to really uh, now make, you know, both, uh, you know, truly uh, admired global company. So the company recently announced uh, that it was withdrawing its its IPO plans and you raised about $60 uh, million uh, recently. So let's talk a little bit about that. Where will these new funds go? What will it go towards sort of building for both? And uh, will it be a premiumization strategy that you're looking at, global expansion? Let's get a little bit into that. Three main areas where we will deploy the funds. Uh, the first area is to really make smartwatches or wearables as our next core. We entered this category relatively late, about 18 months ago. Uh, within a very short amount of time, some of the best-selling watches are both watches. And so we want to deploy this money to essentially you know, create a health and wellness ecosystem. A lot of the game that's being played today is largely a hardware game in watches. Our belief is that if you truly want to make watches uh, relevant, useful, and really make it part of consumers' lifestyles, we really now need to start investing in creating a platform 
that allows us to offer much more advanced features, better analytics, and much more reliability. The game will change from hardware to much more of a software play. And we are one of the very few companies in the world which actually owns our entire end-to-end -end platform. So being able to own the platform and driving it uh, to be able to offer these features, that's going to be the first area of focus. The second is to continue investing in the audio, personal audio category. While we are clear market leaders there, there are significant opportunities that we are seeing to be able to build much more stronger R&D and also start playing in the premium category as you were mentioning. And then the third priority for investment really is around making in India. And for us, it's not about just make in India, but it's about make in India and also engineer and design in India as well. Uh, this year, almost 40% of our manufacturing volume will be produced locally in India. This was almost 0% last year. So that's the big shift we are making to be able to really be a company that's viewed for very strong tech leadership across the world. Vivek, it was lovely chatting with you and thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Moving on, WPP recently hosted its WPP Commerce event in Mumbai after a gap of three years. The event involved workshops, sessions and one-on-one -on -one engagement with key industry leaders to showcase WPP's holistic e-commerce offering. I caught up with CBL Srinivas, country manager, WPP India, on the sidelines of this event and spoke to him about the future of commerce and much more. Let's hear this conversation. CVL, welcome to Storyboard again. It's so good to catch up with you in person after a long time. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Shivani. I know one of the biggest concerns for brands and organizations these days is how to, uh, uh, you know, connect that whole process from discovery to try on to the actual purchase. So how is WPP making that happen? So firstly, uh, let me tell you a bit about WPP Commerce. Uh, we have a bunch of workshops in all the emerging areas around uh, e-com. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, some new stuff around customer experience, we're talking about analytics and predictive analytics and how that's coming into e-com. Uh, we're talking about ONDC, of course, since we're here in India and uh, other other such topics. We also have an experience zone that we're setting up. Uh, yeah, and in all, we're expecting close to 300 people today, lots of our clients, partners, and, and of course, people from across WPP. Uh, so that's as far as the event is concerned. Uh, to address the second part of your question, yeah, I think in the last two or three years, uh, e-com has obviously been on steroids mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic and, uh, you know, digital penetration in the country and so on. Uh, in WPP, uh, in India, over the years, we have be been building expertise in e-com. Mm -hmm. But I would say pre-pandemic, uh, it was more focused on the tech side of e-com. Uh, we have a massive... Uh, global COE in Noida, in near Delhi, uh, where we have uh, a lot of tech experts sitting and building uh, apps and websites for some of the biggest clients globally. Mm. Uh, we run that under, under Wonderman Thompson Commerce. Mm. And that existed pretty much pre-pandemic and of course that scaled up quite a bit. Mm. But what we've done in the last, uh, I would say two, three years is uh, invested in, uh, you know, all the other bits of e-com, be it customer experience, be it on the content side. Mm. Of course, Group M is doing a terrific job on the media side mm. and also getting in a lot of analytics, measurement, etc. So today, actually, if you look at it, as uh, WPP in India, we have uh, an end-to-end e-com -end e service, uh, pretty much offering everything from advisory to measurement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by getting people across our different agencies to kind of uh, work together for clients. And in the last few years, again, we've seen, uh, you know, quite a few assignments come our way uh, by taking this approach of uh, just getting the best of WPP together. And what are the kind of solutions that clients are looking for? You know, how do you actually get, uh, you know, technology that kind of works? Uh, today, we're kind of moving towards real-time commerce, right? Today, we're mm. moving towards social commerce. We're moving yeah. towards voice search. Mm. Uh, we're moving towards a lot of visual kind of stimuli on, on e-com platforms. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of keep pace and ensure that you're able to kind of deliver that mm -hmm. uh, in obviously in a very optimized kind of a way. And then there's this whole bit about the experience or the front end mm -hmm. of uh, e-com, what you and I kind of uh, interact with. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of ensure that uh, you build mm -hmm. a seamless experience mm -hmm. uh, and especially in a market like India across mm -hmm. online and offline. 
uh, and and therefore kind of deliver that. And uh, then, like I spoke about analytics and uh, you know, ex mm. especially predictive analytics, uh, that was a big learning uh, through the pandemic, right? Mm. Supply chains got disrupted, uh, mm. demand in many categories suddenly peaked and then yeah. kind of fell. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of things happened. So how do you get uh, a lot more of analytics and prediction into your e-com mm. strategy? Mm. Uh, is is of course the other piece. Hmm. So I think that's uh, that's what I think we're striving to deliver, and that's what really clients are asking for. Okay, and what according to WBP is going to be the future of commerce in the country? Well, again, uh, well, if you look at India, uh, I think uh, things are taking a very interesting turn, uh, especially with the launch of ONDC. Hmm. Uh, we have, uh, I think, in in in. Uh, with one action, pretty much democratized uh, e-commerce uh, yeah. today, making it possible for uh, you know suppliers, buyers yeah. to kind of uh, get on without any kind of entry barrier. So I think yeah. that's a very very interesting uh, development for us. Yeah. Uh, then this whole thing around the omni-channel kind of experience and the omni-channel kind of a strategy that you need to have, because uh, yeah. while you know we get very carried away with technology and e-commerce and all of that, but in a market like India, there's still so much that happens through traditional trade. Mm. So how do you actually ensure that you're joining the dots and the consumers mm. are getting that mm. omni-channel experience? And I think that is going to continue to be very important here. Mm. Uh, then I, I would look at all the interesting formats that are emerging. And again, mm. some of them I think will be more popular in India. Any other trends which are specific to India market uh, and very different from uh, the global markets uh, as far as commerce is concerned? Hyper-local. Hmm. Uh, is another opportunity. Again, thanks to the pandemic, uh, hmm. that was a learning, right? Uh, uh, it wasn't so much to do with uh, what's available kind hmm. of nationally, but kind of what's available in a, hmm. in a particular pin code and how soon hmm. can you get it. Uh, quick commerce, uh, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of uh, action there. And yeah, but I think more than all of this, uh, the way India has been on this whole path of digitization, starting hmm. with Aadhaar and then coming into UPI and yeah. now getting into ONDC. Hmm. Uh, I think we're truly going to see a massive value unlock uh, for the society at large. Hmm. Uh, just imagine uh, anyone who can create a product or a service today hmm. has the right to kind of get on and uh, trade and, and, and sell it and become yeah. a, a part of a supply network. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Shabani. Thanks for having me. It is time for a short break. On the other side, a sneak peek into CNBC TV 18 Marquee Nights with Yannick Bolori, Chairman Vivendi and Chairman and CEO Avas Group. We have a plan for every little thing. We have a plan for a get together. We have a plan for our kids. We have a plan to work from home. We have a plan for our home. But what about a plan for our bigger home? Our planet Earth. Plan that's sustainable. Plan that's actionable. Plan that's achievable. Plan that's attainable. Tata Power. Sustainable is attainable. Welcome back. Yannick Bolore, Chairman Vivendi and Chairman and CEO of his group was visiting India this week. In our special curated series that brings in fascinating and unplugged conversations, CNBC TV 18 Marquee Nights, Anuradha Sen Gupta caught up with Yannick and spoke to him about many things like ours group growth in India, must take over of Twitter, the impact of negative macroeconomics and politics on business and much more. Let's hear some excerpts. expectations of the Indian market, especially in the current context, would be very high. Is that fair to say? In terms of the growth that you expect from here? 
you know, in terms of growth, even if it's slightly slowing down, it's still a plus uh, 15%, something like that. When you compare to what we see in the rest of the world, like uh, Europe, you know, in Europe, when we have a plus 2%, maybe a plus 3%, it's a record year. So, I mean, in terms of growth, India is no comparison with the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the Western world. So, uh, I still have huge expectations. I think we will continue to invest in India. Uh, now we are uh, 1,200 people. We are finalizing an acquisition that will uh, make us being a group of 1,500 people, I would say, uh, before spring. And I believe, I mean, in five years from now, we can be five, maybe 10,000. The vast has interests in China. Yeah. And we saw how the pandemic has upended uh, the way the world sees China and the global supply chains and, you know, how they're designed. And there's a lot of work and changes happening there. So do you think there's an opportunity for India that's, you know, that, that's even bigger than what it always had because of its demographics and because of, you know, the government that we have and the kind of dynamism that the political leadership is providing? Right. Uh, it's a great question. No, of course... Uh uh, China has had, I would say, a, a different strategy to uh, manage a pandemic. Uh, I would say a more closed one, uh, if I may say, more protective one. So it has uh, uh, slowed down the, the growth. Um, honestly, I think it's, it's a good opportunity for India because uh, in terms of uh, services, uh, in terms of uh, talents, India is very strong. In terms of manufacture, manufacturing as well, could be a great opportunity uh, for India. So no, I believe uh, India is a land of uh, of, uh, of huge opportunities for all the Indian uh, uh, population, but also for the world and for the business, uh, global business like uh, the one we are operating in. This is a story that has been consuming everybody who's interested in the media. Um, Twitter, <laughs> you know. Elon Musk, real-time tweeting, is remaking Twitter in, the, in full public view. He's taken the company private for $44 billion, but he's doing everything in full public view. And he is saying that advertising revenues, which is Twitter's mainstay by far, is going to be a problem. So let's go for subscription revenue. So he's doing exactly the opposite of what Netflix is doing. Of course, they don't compare what Twitter offers and what Netflix does. But what do you make of this? On Elon Musk himself, I remember when he launched uh, or when he acquired Tesla, yeah. all our clients on uh, the traditional car manufacturers were telling me he will never succeed. His cars, their battery will burn. And when you see the results 10 years later, Tesla is uh, the highest uh, uh, car manufacturer in market cap. And uh, when uh, Elon Musk announced that uh, he will launch some rocket that will land back uh, on Earth, uh, everyone was laughing, and he did it. So that's why I wouldn't, you know, bet against him. Underestimate him and not patronize him. him. Yeah. Uh, then on Twitter, what's complex uh, for us is uh, what to tell to our clients. Uh, I mean, it's not about uh, what I think about the blue certification for eight dollars a month or something like that. I mean, it's a different subject. Uh, in terms of the advertising, we need to make sure we need to be responsible. What we need to be making sure of is that our clients are investing in a safe environment. So would you, are you advising uh, Avas's brands to pause? I mean, it's a, I mean, Twitter, it's not like Meta. Or it's not like Google. Uh, Meta and Google are two-thirds of the digital investment. Uh, yeah. Twitter is uh, f even less than 1%. Yeah. Let's say 1%. In to be, India, to be too. Yeah. So it's, it's not, not going to be a game changer for brands to, to pause. We are telling them that you need to make sure, and we need to make sure on your behalf, mm. that you will be on a safe environment. So this is, a, I hope, the constructive discussion that we are having with, uh, with Twitter teams now. It seems that they are changing rapidly, so uh, I will be more safe to answer in one month, maybe two months, to see. But uh, yeah. that is a, the, the main point for us is... Uh, just to make sure that safe. Uh, we everything are safe. safe for your brand. With that, it's a wrap on Storyboard this week. You can catch all of our conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for watching. We will be back same time next week. See you soon.